Our Father, we present our hearts before you. Whatever will distract us, whether inside or outside of our hearts, Father, remove far from us in Jesus' name. We pray, O God, and ask that you give us an attentive ear. Give us a heart of understanding so that the entry of your word will bring light and continue, O God, to give us understanding. We pray, O God, for your servant you're going to use to minister to us. Lord, you have prepared him and given him a message for us at this hour. We ask, O God, that you remind him of every detail of what you have given to him to commit, O Lord, unto us. We cover him in the blood of Jesus Christ. We take authority, Lord Jesus Christ, in your name against every contrary spirit and contrary powers, every contrary presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, we bind and cast you out of this assembly in Jesus' name. We ask, Holy Spirit, as you have your way in our hearts, give us, O God, your message. Give us the heart to believe and also the feet that are quick, O God, to do and practice what you have told us. Be exalted forever, O God, in the assembly. For in Jesus' holy name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. It's my privilege and honor to welcome to the pulpit, to his pulpit, our daddy, our bishop, Reverend Dr. Amichi Wachuku. We've been running a series on the Gospel of Luke, and um, let it not be said of us that we started a walk and didn't complete it. So we will finish that uh, before cracking on the book of Romans, which we have agreed we shall be studying. And in chapter 18 of the book of uh, Gospel of Luke this morning, we'll be looking at certain things that concern our end of year theme. And our end of year, uh, we talked about uh, celebrations of victories of faith in him. And that, incidentally, is the topic of our consideration this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 14. I do believe that uh, I'll get on the fast track when I get to certain sections of the Gospel of Luke, like we've done chapter 17. I deliberately skipped certain passages that connect to chapter 21, dealing with the end of time. So when we get to chapter 21 and we... Combine them, I probably be referring you to our tape on the end of all things is at hand. And I'm sure when we get to other relevant passages like resurrection, I will refer you also to our tapes on the resurrection. That we shall finish that study. And I'm trusting God that every moment I have, He will give me a message from there to share with us. Amen. So let me turn this morning, thank you, to our Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. And there are two segments there. And that is actually the message. Uh, victories of faith, they are won by dogged determination uh, of action. Uh, I will never take no for an answer because God has said it. His victories of faith in him, in his word. And therefore, I'm ready to take any risk uh, in order because of what God has said. And that will take us to the first segment, verses 1 to 8. And then verse 9 to verse 14, we shall be looking at the, the thing that destroys victories of faith. Victories of faith are impossible when pride, selective righteousness, rebellion are enthroned. You can't. So it's important to know where we are as we study this gospel. And you can mark yourself. You can mark the sheets of your paper. Uh, consider this is the end of the year. You can mark it depending on your disposition of heart. Victories of faith are impossible where there are evidences of pride, selective righteousness, where rebellion, they are enthroned. There's no way you can have victories of faith to celebrate. And also, victories of faith are dogged determination to follow action through, a willingness to take 
not take no for an answer because of what God has said. I'm ready to take whatever risk it is based on what God has said. And that's how we have victories of faith. So victories of faith don't come to people who sit by and say, God said it, I believe it, and that's that who we'll see. That's a good song. But I tell you, God said it, you believe it. The only way I know that you believe it is what you're doing. Like James said, demons believe that say God. But they tremble. You can see their action. Also, except your belief, faith without works is dead. And unless there is this faith that bears action, then it is difficult for us uh, to believe what the individual is saying. So let me ask for the reading of our text. And uh, quite frankly, the message is done. Luke chapter 18 from verse 1 to verse 14. And then we'll break up the component. I'll start from the latter component. The things that will make victories of faith impossible. Uh, let me read the entire text, then we go to the exposition of the text. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Verse 2, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he will not for a whole, uh, for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Verse 6. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find Feet on the earth. Would he find people who are believing the body of truth? I'm giving you, that's the word actually there. It's not talking of faith. I believe, I don't believe. Would he find that body of truth that represents the true gospel that I'm giving you? Would he still be on earth? Would it have been watered down? Would it have been something else that people are preaching what they like? Then verse 9 of our text continues. Also, he spoke the parable to them, some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And that is the key thing there. Uh, they despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. By disposition, tax collector is a known sinner. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. That I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Verse 12. I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off will not as much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word in Jesus' name. It is, you may be seated, it's important to keep in perspective what we are talking about. Celebrations of victories of faith. Let me start from the last segment. 
the antithesis, what will make you not celebrate these victories? What are those things that Jesus pointed out in this verses 9 to verse 14 that will make somebody at the end of the whole exercise, you fasted, you are with the men, you are praying maybe from uh, the time is 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., which I know nobody is praying, so that you wouldn't say they targeted you in the message. Or maybe you are praying from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. That's fine. Whatever is your time that you are praying. And in spite of all this, you're struggling. You find out that what is applying to you is Psalm that said, In vain you wake up early and go late to bed, eating the bread of anxious toils. Because he give it to his beloved. Sleep. What if he jet him? Nothing. What has happened? That's what we want to look at, verses 9 to verse 14. Victories of faith. Celebrations of victories of faith. What are the things? One of them, he told us there, Jesus didn't leave us musing. He spoke in verse 9, spoke parable, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, number one. The second component, they despised others that we are not. Uh, nothing is more dangerous in the kingdom of God than selective righteousness. I'm not doing this. Therefore, I'm okay. They don't know what they are doing because you know this. In his selective righteousness is the greatest bondage that children of God who could have made heights have been kept in a prison house that nobody can free you. Knowledge cannot unless with a special mighty hand of God that God loves you. Then there may be what in the words of C.S. Lewis accidental intervention of God through circumstances breaking your yoke breaking you to see that you're on the wrong road. Unless God does that, the person that is cocooned in this selective righteousness is trapped where he cannot come out. It's not just bars of iron. It's an alloy of bars of iron and bronze, metals of diamond, if it's possible, put together that has encased this soul. And that's what Jesus was saying. That's what will make you and I not to have celebrations of victories of faith. Number one, trusted in themselves already a negation of the whole essence of Calvary. Because the master told us that apart from him, we can do nothing. And the book of Proverbs says that he who trusts himself is a fool. Yet, the same book of Proverbs in another passage says, Lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So, this first thing that the master hits here, immediately attacks and tells, this is what will make this sister, this is what will make this brother, this child. It happens even in education in school. What are we going to study this morning? And the teacher says, listen, we want to finish up what we are doing the other day, an analysis of the uh, carbon uh, electrons and we want to look at the uh, uh, discuss the issue of electrolytes ah I'm a man, I'm a man. there's nothing they are saying that you are listening you know it and at the end of the day you find out that you don't know anything number one the theory you have is the old one you are still putting Dalton's atomic theory you don't know that things have been superseded by other things. You still believe that the atom is the smallest indivisible particle of a, a, a molecule, whatever is the definition you have. Those things have been exceeded by the division and the fusion and the fact that we have an atomic bomb. That theory is no more. Now listen to the new one. No, 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 no. I'm a man. I'm a man. And when you run into that danger, it stalls your progress. I don't care what is your discipline. Pride is an antithesis to learning. 
Anybody who is proud can never learn anything. I don't care whether you are learning how to be a mechanic, how you are learning how to be a driver, how you are learning how to sew, to bake cake, to do anything, decoration. You can never learn it once pride is part of your commodity. It will stand on your way because the proud cannot grow further than what they are. You've already blocked the channel of learning. It is and what causes pride? Unfortunately, if you ask some, well, I, I knew better than they are. But in the real essence of discipline, both those who did humanities and those who did the divine sciences, you know that pride is nothing but inferiority complex inverted. When you see somebody having a complex that's what he must, he fights it off with pride. And, and that pride is what he used to defend himself or herself. But the, the true thing inside, when you are well complex, we don't need to Turn with me to a first reading that I want to take on this regard. First Corinthians chapter 8 and what he says there on this regard. First Corinthians chapter 8. From verse 1. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. That's Corinthians 8. I just read verse 1. Now I'm reading verse 2. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as much as you ought. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, it tells you that even when you have become the professor or professors in your particular discipline, it is but a minuscule, for we know in part. And that's the reality. That's why when you find what Jesus is saying here in Luke chapter 18, he spoke this parable on what would make people to end this year and have no celebrations. Number one thing, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And yet the scripture is very clear. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the second part of that particular verse, and despise others as nothing more deadly. And this is where selective righteousness comes in. Nothing more deadly. Somebody does something, kill him, kill him. When you do it, you say, well, he's the devil. You will never admit he's the devil for the next person, but for you, you want us to understand your motive. It's not what I had in my mind. God knows my heart. Yeah, God knows your heart. I'm not God. I don't know your heart. We are discussing what you did. It's if you really look at it on my heart, I didn't want it to turn out this way. But you never give the next person a chance that it will not turn out that way. You were looking at his action and this thing like the Pharisees that preceded you, she did this and according to the law, we should stone him. You never give a chance. You despise others. Because they were not what you are supposed to be. And in your esteemed order of knowledge which is imperfect, incomplete, without anything, you have chosen to ignore the scripture that says, judge nothing before it's time. You don't have the facts. And what you think you know by the time you are confronted with issues, you probably know that you'll be the one saying, I am sorry, and not the other way around. Oh, I sit on my table as pastor, even if it's only of this church for 29 years, I had other places, get it to 40 years. And somebody comes in and say this and say that and do the other one, and I say, yes, I've heard. This thing you're saying, are you ready to repeat it before the next person? Yes, 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 yes. I said, why don't you go and check some of these things out? Time and time again, nine and a half times out of ten, 
It's not the way they thought it was. And by the time they get to know, they are saying sorry. But that's not a sorry born out of repentance. It's a sorry born out of vindictive wickedness that was not materialized. They did not get what they wanted. And so if only we can look at the master so that we can celebrate victories of faith this year. Remove these two things. Self-righteousness. It leads to nowhere. It's a dead end. Because nobody, nobody. Sammy said, if thou, O Lord, were to mark iniquity, who will stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, O God, that you may be feared. Brethren, we are kept by the mercies of God. And, and I like you, wherever you are, and whomever you are, listening this morning, wherever you're coming from, come away from this dead end. He said, dead end. He spoke the parable to some who trusted in themselves. They were righteous and despised others. I don't, I don't have the time, but just for the purposes of Textual preaching, let it be that we read through the text. Verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. A tax collector by designation is a sinner because he's doing a job that society says is wrong and is truly wrong. Corrupt people. They tax people beyond what the Romans. They are working for the oppressors. So they're already in a bad order and they are collecting money for the oppressors. So it's wrong. Apart from working for the oppressors, they collect more than is required for their own pockets. So they didn't make their job easier. And what is it that is going on? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you. You can see why so many thanksgiving people will tell you, oh, thanksgiving, you can do your own thanksgiving. It doesn't matter. God is not a, it's not, you don't have to come to the church even though God says, this particular one, once in a year, I don't know you can do. Not every thanksgiving you say. It doesn't even leave your mouth because your thanksgiving is a curse on you. You are insulting God. Look at what he's thanking God. Lord, I thank you. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. To the far off, pray to himself. I'm not like other men. How, how is that important? How does that make any difference? That you are not like other men. Are you like Christ? Did the Bible say looking out under men? Or did he say looking unto Jesus? What does he say in your Bible? Looking unto Jesus. I'm not like other men. So what? And then he hasn't finished. He, he was not satisfied with that because one of his enemies came to the church. And he was hoping that at the end of the service he would tell daddy that I don't know whether the chief usher is actually doing his job very well. How can they allow this person to come into the church? He noticed somebody he knows as an enemy. So he, he's not going to stop with saying, I'm not like other men. He's going to delineate it so that anybody listening will know. And even the man in question will know. Stood up, prayed, not like other men, extortioners, nori, unjust. If we are, we are John Maddow. Even as this task collector. Imagine that you are praying here in a church and somebody is staying here praying and the other person is staying here praying and you are saying, God, I thank you, I'm not like other men. All, all, all these people who, who wear color all over the place. I'm not like them. Is it in doubt those you are talking to? No, the man knows. So at a point when he felt that general thing was not enough, he point or like this tax collector. Before you be an usher, you must have discernment. Yes, I can have discernment of spirit. So that you don't let in all these people into the church. How can you allow this man into the church? Extortioners, unjust, or even as this tax collector. Anyway, I fast twice a week. You can never take his good money. His money is bad. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
And then the tax collector. The tax collector. Couldn't even approach the half of the area of the temple and was beating his breast. Couldn't even raise his eyes and say, and look at this prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus' verdict was that this man went home justified more than the other person. Brethren, we're not asking you not to know whether you're righteous or unrighteous, but that's not premise for judging other people. And you must be very careful. You run into things that will negate your celebrations of victories this year. And that is, as I said, is a bar that is made of the strongest metal known to man, diamond. Some people wonder whether it's a diamond or just, uh, or whether it's a metal or whether it is, but whatever it is, it's the strongest metal. And then you find out that this thing is where somebody is encased because of what they think they know. And that's why you say, well, the word of God, the word of God can't reach. It will take a dynamite from heaven if the one is an elect to reach them. And then you go to the other aspects that we talked about. Victories of faith are not won by chanting it. We must see the action you are taking this year because you believe that this is a year of celebrations of victories based on the word of God. Not presumption. Not getting up. Like one of you are, who approached me this morning and announced the wedding date. I said, have you finished with the marriage committee? He said, no. But this is the date we have chosen. He said, okay. Uh, that the marriage committee haven't given me your file. I said, Daddy, I know, but that's the date we have chosen. <laughs> I smiled back to them too. <laughs> and after laughing, I told them, this wedding is hereby cancelled. <laughs> How can you precede the marriage committee that by the grace of God I set up, you don't respect them, and you're announcing a date and printing a card for your wedding. The marriage committee have not given me your file. They, I have not seen your file. Let alone deliberate on it. My new print, you got card. If I had to go, I know some of you will be wondering, even the marriage committee can ask, yeah, is it the people we are talking that must happen? Remember, I'm talking about a revelation. I was in the island of Transekulu and I saw in the vision. So you, you, can, you, can go, you can go to the island of Patmos and ask John, what did you see? Okay, so it, it is important that we understand ourselves. But, you know, sometimes uh, some of you who have been here long enough will know. Now, you can go to the so let me go back to what we are saying in chapter 18. In chapter 18, uh, uh, and de dealing with victories of faith is not presumption. So you don't presume anything. You don't come and say, it is rooted on the word of God. And because God said it, I want to see your action. And that's what Jesus said to them, that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Brethren, there are times when you pray, and if that never happened to you, it does happen to me. You know, you lose heart. You really ask yourself questions. God, I've added fasting on this. I've added waiting. What is the problem? You know, you pray, but Jesus is saying here, victory of faith will be won even if you don't seem to see it, you persist. Because God will never fail in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here. Saying there was, a, and he gave the illustration of a certain man in a city, a certain woman, a widow, and how she came to him, a judge that feared neither God nor man. Let me tell you, when you have that combination in any system, it's terrible. Somebody who will not act because of God and will not act because of the system, then what are you talking about? 
He's virtually a God on himself. But this woman kept on pressing and kept on pressing and kept on pressing until one day this man said, listen, she's going to weary me and I'm going to give her what she wants. And that is the conclusion that Jesus made. Then the Lord said, hear what, verse 6, hear what the unjust judge said, verse 8, 7, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I want to say to some of you, there are certain situations in your life, you've been crying out for long, some of you 10 years, 5, some even longer. Don't give up. God will answer. The premise for victories of faith is never giving up. You don't have victories of faith won when you gave up. And most times, it gets darkest before dawn. And at the, just at the point of your victory, if you are not careful, that's when you may be discouraged. An enemy knows that you are about to take a turn for the better. I may be talking to some lady here. You've been praying about situation about your children. It appears that even the last one you have hope had gone haywire. And you are asking, Chineke Barankit, and Or maybe it's concerning your husband. I'm talking to a, a man here about your wife, and somehow you've been praying. And she's continuing with that ancient trade she got from her mother. And in spite of your patience and everything, nothing is going on. And for your children, they don't appear to turn. I want you to know that God will answer you. I am talking to a single, single girl or a single, a single boy here. And year in, year out, you come with hope every year. Hoping that this is a year God will give you desires of your heart. As one month succeeds another, you begin to ask. You don't even question just yourself. The enemy begins to suggest to you whether Christianity is really worth it. You've been trusting God for the fruit of the womb, and one year after another, doing all that is prescribed, but nothing. This is what you said here. And shall God not avenge his own who cry out there and night unto him, though he bears long with them? I tell you, yes, he will avenge speedily. Nevertheless, when the Lord comes, would he still find out that you are still waiting? Have you gone to other gods to help you? Have you gone to other things to help you? Are you still relying upon God and on him alone? Or have you listened to that there is somebody somewhere who can make a way for you? Or are you still relying on the one who made the heavens and the earth? He will never fail. Brethren, let's keep on keeping on. God will surely come true. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. If you're here this morning, and perhaps you, you are asking, this thing they are saying, what we are saying is only applicable to children of God. I'm not talking of dinner joker. Anybody can go to church. Satan is the first to come to church. His demons are the first to sit in the pew. I'm talking about those who are born again by the Holy Spirit. Who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You may be in church, but you don't know anything about Christ or the church. And that's what I'm asking today. If you're here, and you have never made a conscious decision surrendering your life to Jesus. So you came into a place where they were preaching and they said, Now before we go into the main thing here, how many of you here want to receive Jesus? You raise your hand. Okay. Just pray with me. Jesus, Jesus, I surrender, I surrender. Now you are a Christian. Now let's now pray for the things you came for. Pray for your messages. Pray for your motto. Pray for your melodia. If that's how you became born again, listen carefully. 
Listen carefully. You haven't been born again according to what Jesus said. Not what I said. You need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Except a man is born again of the spirit and of water, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To be born again is a deliberate action of the will where you surrender your will, you surrender your intellect, and you surrender your emotion, and you personally invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. If you have never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do so today, if you're here. He said, how do I do it, man of God? Oh, just stand where you are, and I'll pray with you. I said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender to him. You stand where you are, and I will lead you in a prayer. A prayer where Jesus will become the Lord of your life. God bless you as you are doing that. He will become the Lord of your life. And becoming the Lord of your life, he will make sure that the enemy will not cheat you this year. Your life will be a celebration of victories of faith in him. He said, I want to give my life to Jesus. What do I do? Just stand where you are, and I want to pray with you. You have opportunity to do so right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm inviting you into my life. Wherever you are, and as you stand, I want to pray with you right now. It is important that you follow it. You say, man of God, must I stand? Can't I sit and do it? No. That was the problem of the first man. He thought he knew better than God. The instruction is stand. And that's just a simple thing. That's how God is going to meet you this morning. If you don't stand, God can never meet you. It's not possible. It's not a question of that I was in a church. I did everything they asked others to do. You can do anything they are, but you disobey the primary instruction. The first instruction is stand. And it is in that standing that you have shown faith. And therefore, the prayer we are praying will be met by you and God will honor it. Let me ask you to do yourself one more favor. If you are standing this morning, make room for them. Just meet me over here so I can reach you. Uh, it's faster for you to reach me here so I can pray with you. I want to just come over here. Please make room for them. Make room for them. And wherever you are, I, I want you to join them here. I want to pray. I receive Jesus, I receive him, and I want to pray with you. I want to agree with you in prayer. I want to ask him to make the difference in your situation. As you stand, remember it's before him, not man. He doesn't care who is watching or who is not. What is at stake is your life. And this God will make a change today. You will notice the change it will make in your life. And just before I start praying for these ones, I want to ask again. You are here. My dear, no na miri in chabanya anya ojo bulumu. Ino ni mu no kajo kumu ojo ka. You are in the church and you are heading to hell. It's terrible. And that's why I'm urging you today. If you are here. You know you haven't made that decision and you need to make that decision. I invite you to step forward and join this winning team as we pray for them. Let me ask you who are standing here to repeat after me. Say it, what I'm asking, going to ask you to say so I can hear you. And the angels of God that are always with me and they're always here, they will hear you. Lord Jesus Christ, I stand before you today and I accept your word that all have seen, including me. And therefore, I ask you, forgive me my sins. Today, I invite you into my life as my savior, and my Lord, deliver me from the powers of darkness. Today, I cut myself off from every power of darkness, every spirit of wickedness 
that is hindering my progress. Today, I enter into a new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will pray with you because the Bible says that if any two of you shall agree concerning any matter, it shall be established for them. And I swear I agree with you in prayer and we pray with you. Some of my people will help you deepen this. And I ask saints who know what this hour is all about to pray in agreement with the prayers they have made and as we agree with them, the God of glory, the spiritual transaction that the Bible says, there is joy in heaven, we shall join the host of heaven in rejoicing. Father, we pray for these ones, O God. And we speak redemption to them. We speak salvation. We speak liberation. Father, we break every yoke of the enemy. We decree today that by the power that raised you from the grave, O God, every yoke of the enemy shall be broken. The anointing of God, O oh God, shall set free by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ. We speak that liberty unto this vessel and command whatever they are, O oh God, in the sea, in the land, on the air, challenging them, burning them up by the fire of the Lord, O oh God, and declaring the liberty that comes from knowing, saying that by the reason of the anointing, O oh God, the yoke of the enemy is broken. Jesus' victory shall be your victory. Thank you, O oh God. For in Jesus' name we pray. There are people at your back that will help you to deepen the decision you have made and I'd like you to follow them.